I hope you're all ready for a nice easy topic now because we're going to look at the application of electric fields which basically means we are going to look at electric circuits and we're starting off nice and gently with the topic of charge and current. First of all I just want to try and clear up some potential misconceptions about electric circuits. So all I want you to do is imagine that there is a circuit in front of you. It's real simple, just a power supply and a bulb. So how long does it take from when I plug in the power supply for the bulb to come on? Just have a little think, explain it to yourself. Why? What's the reasoning behind your answer? Okay. Now hopefully you answered immediately. Like the moment you plug it in, it turns on. So just to explore that a little further, if it wasn't just a little circuit in front of you, what if the wires were a lot longer? So what if the bulb was much further away? What happens then? Well, it turns out it still happens immediately. Okay, so let's just stretch the analogy. What if instead of just being, you know, from the opposite side of the room, I've now placed um, one bulb on the moon and I've got the power supply on the earth? Well, if I plug that in, it'll still light up immediately. It'll be absolutely instantaneous. And the reason for that is because the electrons that are carrying this energy that um, allows the bulb to light up are already in the wires inside the bulb and they all start to move instantaneously the moment that I connect up my circuit and that is because of the electric fields that each of those ones generate and the potential difference that we're going to create with the, uh, the power supply. So it works because everything moves together because the electric fields all talk to each other all at once and as soon as I make a change to electric fields in one place it affects everywhere so it is an absolutely immediate thing. Now I've used the word current, so we need to define it. So current is just the rate of flow of charge. Simple, nice, easy one. So how is it that we are moving charge around in circuits? Well, it depends on what type of circuit. If it is a metal wire, it will be the electrons that are doing the moving. So you have the metal ions in your um, lattice here, like this, and then we've got a whole load of free or delocalized electrons that are quite happy just to move around. And as soon as we connect a power supply, all those electrons will start moving together. Now the wire is one option. The other option is we could have um, different types of charge carriers. So instead of electrons, we could have any charged particle. So it could be um, any sort of ion. Sorry about that. I haven't quite shaken my cough just yet. Um, so anyway, in an electrolyte, which is just a liquid that can carry an electric current, um, the charge carriers can be positive or negative ions as well. So we don't just have electrons as charge, carrier, as charge carriers in electric circuits, and we don't just have uh, negative charges moving. We can also have positive ones moving. So that's why in our definition of current, we don't talk about electrons. We talk about the rate of flow of charge. So it does matter. Um, so, because we are talking about current and rate of flow, we need to think about which direction it's flowing in, because that's going to matter. So if I have a circuit, hopefully we all know uh, which is the positive terminal and which is the, short, the negative terminal. Um, if you want a really horrible way to remember it, people who are tall and thin are generally more positive about life, and people who are short and a bit fat are sometimes a bit more negative about life. I don't really believe that, but if it helps you remember, that's all that matters. Um, so those are our terminals. Hopefully we know that the electrons will obviously flow from the negative terminal, terminal towards the positive one. But when we talk about the flow of current, we always consider it as being from positive towards negative. Because this is just about the flow of charge. It doesn't have to be negative charge or positive charge. So what they pick, they picked a direction. We said we're going from positive to negative. So just be careful you don't confuse the two. Charge, uh, charge flow current is always positive to negative, even though the electrons will actually be going the other way around. When we get to capacitors, you're going to need to watch that. Okay, so electric circuits considered flow from positive to negative. Either easy said that. Uh, yep, yeah, and we say that regardless of which way the actual charge carriers are going. So, um, the next thing I want to just check is that we got the definition for a Coulomb. I think we did with Liam, but just in case, because I know we were a bit unhappy about it, here it is again. One Coulomb is the amount of charge which flows past a point 
in a circuit in a time of one second when the current is one amp. So it's a pretty easy one to remember. And hopefully, from that definition, you should actually be able to realise that there is an equation behind it. So this is a good opportunity to just pause the video, have a think, what is the equation behind that definition? Okay, so hopefully from that, you could have gotten that I, the current, equals delta Q over delta T, or one of the rearrangements of that. So I is going to be in amps, Q is the amount of charge, which is in coulombs, and T is the amount of time in seconds that it is flowing for. So nice, easy equation. It's been a little while. But that's not, you know, the most useful thing. It doesn't tell us a lot. We could actually do a lot better. And we can do a lot better from our definition of what um, current is. So we said that current is the amount of charge that's moving per second. So what does that actually depend on? Well, the current will depend on the speed at which the charged particles are moving, how much charge each particle is carrying, and how many charged particles are moving. With all that information, that would give me the current. So actually, the current is telling me a lot more than just um, you know, the amount of charge per second. It can also tell me about um, <clears throat> how many charge carriers there are present at the time, if I know the size of the wire. So let's see if we can do a bit better then. So let's say that I'm going to call the cross-sectional area of the wire A and the number of charge carriers per meter cubed is just N. Well that would mean that in one meter of wire I would have A times N charge carriers. So that's a term for how many charge carriers I have. So now let's say that they're traveling at a speed V. Well then the number of charge carriers that are going to pass a point per second will be the number of charge carriers per meter multiplied by how fast they're travelling in metres per second, so ANV. So that gives me a term for how many and a term for how fast. So all that's left with is how much charge. So if I just multiply by Q, that gives me the current again. So I've got a slightly more useful version of um, Q equals IT. I've got I equals ANQV or I equals ANEV because most often we are going to be using electrons. So there we go, that gives me, for an electric current through a wire, I get I equals A N E V. Okay, I just realised my title is messed up, so should we just fix that? Ah. So what you get for trying to fix it on the fly, that'll do. Um, so I is going to be current in amps, A is the cross-sectional area of the wire, N is the number of electrons per metre cubed, it's also called the electron number density. Remember that one, they try to use that term in the exam quite a lot. Um, E is the charge on the electron, obviously, and V is what we're going to call drift velocity. So um, I am just going to give you a question. Um, I would like you to calculate this and bring your answer to the lesson on Tuesday. So I'd just like you to calculate the mean drift velocity of electrons in a copper wire with that cross-sectional area, uh, 5 times 10 to the minus 6 meters squared, when the current is 1 amp, if the electron number density for the copper wire is 8.5 times 10 to the 28 meters uh, per meter cubed. So I'm looking for the number and a comment on your number. Pretty easy. Uh, should be no problem for you guys at all. So bring that to the session and we'll have a chat about it then. So I called the velocity the drift velocity. And that is because the charged particles do not travel in a straight line. They kind of zig and zag all over the place. They collide with the positive um, ions. They collide with the other electrons. There's a lot going on there. So they don't just go in a straight line, which is why we don't call it the velocity. We call it the drift velocity. Because on the whole, they do move along the wire, but they do so a little bit erratically going all over the place. Um, so that's why we're going to call it the drift velocity. Okay, I'm just going to throw one more... Um, little piece of information in for you. Just one of our first circuit laws. Um, it should be a really obvious one, but all it says is that um, this is Kirchhoff's first law, by the way. He has got more than one, so you're going to have to get them the right way around. We'll just start with one for today. We'll go real easy. Um, all it says is that the sum of the currents entering any point in a circuit is equal to the sum of the currents leaving that same point. Pretty straightforward and obvious, really. Now, this is a specific statement of a conservation law. 
So the other thing I would like to think about before you come to the next session is which conservation law is this a special statement of? What is this telling us must be conserved? What can we not lose? So just have a little think about that. Also, learn it. Um, okay, one last thing that you will need to learn is um, some circuit symbols. There we go. Um, so these are all of the circuit symbols that you will need to learn. Let me just slide that out of the way. Um, so there are 12 here. These are the ones the exam board expects you to know. Uh, ammeter, voltmeter, cell, an indicator or a light source. Um, that could be a bulb, but it, it could just be anything that indicates the circuit is on. Um, a diode, a light emitting diode, resistor, variable resistor, thermistor, a light pendant resistor or LDR if you're lazy, um, heater and electric motor. So you do need to know all of these. We will talk about more of these later. Um, I guess the only things I will mention is that these arrows, when they are not going through a uh, component, always indicate light. Um, the arrow indicates variability. So um, if you want to be a smart aleck, you can turn up on Tuesday and tell us how you would draw the symbol for a variable power supply. Um, and then diodes. Diodes are special components. If we've not met them before, they only let current flow through them in one direction. So the way you know the direction goes is because if you look, there are a little arrow. So if you follow the arrow, you get through. If you come from the other direction, you just hit brick wall, so you can't get through. So diode will only let the current flow through it one way and a light emitting diode will let current flow through it in one way and when it does it turns on so that's what leds are okay and that is the lot super duper easy right um hopefully a little bit of relief after doing all the electric field stuff uh there will be a lot more practical though is the flip side of this and we're going to get our hands on some circuits next session okay remember if you've got any questions just ask when you see us